Good evening, everybody. You're very welcome. And I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our bi biomedical talk um, by Dr. Sean Lyons, and it's entitled The Changing Face of, biomedical Pla of the Biomedical Plastics Industry, New Challenges and Solutions. This is part of a series of talks that are happening all around Ireland, and the aim is to promote and give an insight into biomedical engineering. The Southeast region is delighted to be part of these national talks. Firstly, I'd like to bring your attention to the fire exits in the audito auditorium. We have three at the back and two at the front. So if you hear a fire alarm, just make your way in an orderly fashion to the exits. Dr. Ken Thomas, will, a member of the Southeast Committee, Committee of Engineers Ireland, will introduce Dr. Sean Lyons. Um, in the absence of Dr. Austin Coffey this evening. So we apologise for Dr. Coffey. Mr. Mark Kelleher then, who's the Vice Chairman of Engineers in Ireland Biomedical Engineering Division, will provide the concluding remarks. You're invited to ask questions at the end of all the presentations. This evening is being live, live streamed through the Engineers Ireland website. So I'd like to welcome all of you out there in cyberspace. Welcome to our talk. Feel free to use Twitter and Facebook. You can see the handles on the screen here. And the event is being recorded and will be available to download at a later stage, together with a paper from Dr. Lyons. So if you don't actually want to be in the live stream, you can sit up at the side here. Light refreshments will be available after the talk, just outside in the atrium. So we encourage you to stay and network a little bit. Members of the South East Committee will be available to meet you after also, and we can discuss up and, co up and coming events. We have an events calendar that we'd like to distribute with you. We can talk about CPD and perhaps how to join if you're not a member. And finally, enjoy the evening. We hope to see you again at future events over the coming months, and basically in, have a great time. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Mary. Um, again, just welcome to everybody here this evening for our talk. Um, again, apologies on behalf of Austin. Austin Coffey is um, he's in Thailand at the moment and he wasn't able to get back. And I'm sure he'd love to have been here to, 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 to present tonight, but uh, we wish him all the best. So it's my pleasure to actually welcome everybody here this evening. My name is Ken Thomas. I'm the head of School of Engineering here in WIT. But I'm also on the Southeast Committee for Engineers Ireland with Mary and indeed other colleagues here as well. So you're all very welcome. Um, we actually have two main presentations tonight is from Sean, but we also have a, a shorter presentation as well afterwards from Mark, uh, Mark Kelleher from the Biomedical uh, Division. So we'll have two presentations and then we'll have time for, some qu for questions and hopefully some answers. Uh, <laughs> we'll, see how th we'll see how tough the questions are, Sean. Um, and I know um, uh, many of you are, are probably under pressure to get away. I know Sean himself is actually under pressure to get back, but there is going to be some tea and refreshments afterwards, uh, tea, coffee and refreshments outside afterwards. Uh, but maybe we'll, it'll probably take about an hour, I think the whole, uh, the, between the two presentations, the questions and answers, uh, and we should have everybody out of here by maybe 7.15, 7.20, if that's what suits everybody here. So I'm just going to quickly maybe introduce Sean. Uh, I know there's a lot of friends and colleagues in the audience here, Sean. Sean is the Centre Manager for the APT Technology Gateway, hosted at the Materials Research um, Institute at Adnone Institute of Technology. So it's a nationally a national centre technology gateway funded by Enterprise Ireland mainly, and we have one here as well in WIT, and I see Ramesh is here also from a from the same research centre. So these research centres are really important, and again, Sean will will probably talk about that and his role in that. As centre manager, he's responsible for delivering and implementing the centre business plan, and takes a leadership role in fostering polymer materials and manufacturing research at a national and international level in conjunction with indus industrial and academic partners, world-class researchers and funding agencies. And we're in a really po strong position in Ireland in this respect, and I'm sure Sean will probably refer to that in his talk. It's amazing the number of companies that are out there doing fantastic work in, in this space. Sean is a graduate of polymer engineering from Athlone, where he completed his PhD studies, and in addition is a chartered engineer, which is good news for Engineers Ireland, that we, we like to have people who are chartered engineers. Um, and following his PhD studies, he worked on an industry-based uh, postdoctoral fellowship, which enabled the development and licensing of 
orientated polymeric, poly polymeric films for use in the ophthalmic industry and subsequently as the lead researcher on the production of electrically active thermoplastic composites for use in the energy industry. Big words, but uh, hopefully Sean will explain all of these shortly. Um, obviously, as you know, or many of you know, that he, he gained extensive industrial experience locally here as a senior scientist in the material science group at Bosch and Lom, and I think there's some Bosch and Lom colleagues here in the audience. That was 2010 to 2014, so not too long ago. He also has acted as external examiner uh, to our MSc in Innovative Technologies Engineering here in WIT, so we know Sean well. And uh, you, Sean, you're very welcome. I can invite you to give your presentation. Thank you. Cheers. Well, hello. Um, I try not to bore you too much over the course of the next 45 minutes or an hour, but uh, for those of you who know me well, you probably know that I tend to use a paragraph when a sentence would do. So. Uh, if, uh, if I'm getting too boring, feel free to throw whatever objects you, you want at me. Um, I'm, first of all, I want to thank Mary and Mark and the guys down uh, Engineers Ireland and Waterford IT for inviting me to, to talk to you today. Uh, I suppose the title of the talk is a bit, of, is a bit long winded, like myself. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the changing face of the biomedical plastics industry. Um, really, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is what are plastics, what are they used in, and what kind of technologies can we, can we look at using? And, uh, because I knew Ramesh was going to be joining us here tonight, I uh, thought we'd talk a little bit about additive manufacturing as well. So uh, I suppose we'll talk a little bit first because I'm not sure what your backgrounds are, so I'm going to just really briefly describe what a polymer is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about additive manufacturing, a tiny bit about factory 4.0 and what it means. We'll touch on some advanced manufacturing things like micro-molding and biodegradable stents and coatings. I'll try to give you some examples and, and talk about some of the things that are happening in those various areas. Um, so as Ken mentioned, um, plastics is a huge market in general, not just in Ireland, but worldwide. The largest part of it is the disposable medical device market. So that's the largest market for anything. And that comes from everything from contact lenses from the Bosch and Lam guys that are here, to microfluidics devices for lab on a chip for people with insulin, to plastic needles or plastic enclosures. Currently in Ireland, there's about 29,000 people employed in medtech in general. That's not just plastics, but medtech in general. And uh, most of the medical technology companies are actually based here. And there's a lot of clusters around Galway, Waterford, Cork, all of them specializing in medical polymers. Um, one of the things that always strikes me about the plastics industry in Ireland is it has a bit of a problem with its identity. Because you often hear about these medical, pla medical companies, and the Irish Medical Device Association represents those guys. And you'll find that a lot of the guys who are making catheters or making contact lenses or whatever it happens to be would describe themselves as medical companies. But fundamentally, they're plastics companies. Equally, people in the aerospace industry making composites for cars or airplanes, they would call themselves composites companies. But fundamentally, they're plastics companies. There is a body representing plastics companies in Ireland called Plastics Ireland, and they represent quite a lot of the members of these people. Um, and they work hard to get the ideas and the technologies there, and also to try to promote the industry so graduates can come. Because unfortunately, when you hear the word plastics in the news, the first image most of us thinks of is a seal stuck in a beer thing or something like that, and it's choking and nobody likes the idea of plastics. But in most cases, plastics are really high-tech materials. Another important part to realize about plastics is it's a huge growth market, particularly the medical polymers field. The applications for resins alone are in the billions of dollars every year annually. Not only is the medical polymer field growing, but individual fields within it are growing. So you've got 3D printing applications for medical applications are growing. The medical device uh, market is growing. Connected healthcare market is growing. You know, five years ago, we wouldn't be wearing watches that measure our heart rate, for instance. That's now almost every day occurrence. People are now walking around wearing personalized health. Um, they're, they're also walking around from hospitals, freeing up uh, hospital spaces by having um, marketing, uh, sorry, having connected health devices attached to them permanently. So what is a polymer? I suppose if I, if I divide polymers into two main groups, thermoplastic materials and thermoset materials. Now, I really wish I could come up with a better example for the difference between them, but this was the best one I could come up with. So a thermoplastic material is like a block of ice. You can melt that block of ice over and over again, and it'll flow, and then you can cool it back down, and it'll go solid again. And you can do that as many times as you want. And that's what a thermoplastic material is like. A thermoset material is a bit more like an egg. Once you boil the egg, the egg is boiled. There is no unboiling that egg. So the difference fundamentally is a thermoset material a thermoset polymer material, once it has been heated and formed, 
it's very, very difficult to unheat and unform that material, whereas a thermoplastic material can be formed over and over again. And there's loads of reasons why you'd want a thermoplastic material and loads of reasons why you'd want a thermoset material. The most obvious thermoset example is the light fittings on the walls or the plugs fittings on the walls. You don't want a case where you have a fire break out and your plastic melts and starts dripping. So what you want is a thermoset material that once it's set, it does not burn. It does not melt. It does not flow. All it'll do is char. Fundamentally, a polymer is just a long group of carbon chains. Actually, if, you, if I were to throw up the periodic table of the elements up here, you'd actually see there's loads and loads of elements. But polymers actually only come from about five or six. They tend to have a long carbon backbone. And then we change one little thing with one little atom on each backbone, and we get an entirely different polymer. And those pro the properties that we can get from these polymers by just changing one tiny thing is huge. So the entire polymer industry is based on these tiny substitutions. But in most cases, the industries that, that serve the medical polymer market, they don't buy a pure polymer. In fact, they probably don't even know exactly what it is they're buying. They buy a formulation. And that formulation is going to have things that help the polymer work. Things like flow modifiers, things like additive, additives, things like stabilizers. And in most cases, the companies like Dow or Arkema or whoever it happens to be that's supplying those would probably not even tell those companies exactly what's in them. Those formulations are often trade secrets. Some companies can get hold of them. Mostly the medical device companies, they do tend to know what's in it because they need to for regulatory purposes. So the fundamental thing that makes polymers different to all other materials is their molecular weight, or how many of the chains of polymers are put together. So if you take something like water, H2O, we all know what it is, we all know what it stands for. Two hydrogen uh, atoms, one oxygen atom. So you can, it's a very small molecule. Polymers, however, tend to be long chain molecules. So the typical molecular weight is a million compared to you know, 30 or 40 for some of the materials we're normally used to. And it's that long molecular weight that gives it all its important properties. We call them macromolecules. Another thing that's interesting about polymers is they're not straight. So if you were to see this in a chemistry book, you'd see this sort of, this is polyethylene. So it's got two carbons at the backbone and four hydrogens. And then they go on and on and on and on forever. And that N number tells you how many of them are added together. So the molecular weight, if this was, was one million, then that N would be one million. Okay? But that isn't a straight line. It's just a big tangled mess. And it's those entanglements and that difficulty in flowing that makes polymers flow past each other and have viscosity. And it's that viscosity that the medical pl plastics industry uses to melt them, flow them into shapes, and cool them down so they give you some strength. So you can see a polymer actually just looks like a big entangled ball of wires on a micro scale. So, what are the challenges in the plastics industry? Uh, I suppose in the medical industry, it's a little different to the aerospace industry or even the military industry. Typically speaking, most innovations would come from somewhere like a military background, because that's where a lot of the R&D funding goes into. Um, in medical device industry, you typically have different challenges in the sense that a product is marketed for a very, very, very long period of time, and it takes quite a while to develop it. So the development time involves a large amount of cost very early on. Thus, the time to market is quite slow. Energy costs is a constant problem for the medical plastics industry because to form any thermoplastic polymer, you've got to heat it up. You have to heat it up often to in excess of 200 degrees. That takes energy. Then you've got to cool it down. And indeed, the machines that do this take quite a bit of energy. The regulated medical environment means that the materials have to be regulated, the process has to be regulated, and the people working in it have to be regulated. Reliability and availability of materials is a huge issue, mainly because you have all of these materials coming from different sources. So to make polymers don't really have a single number associated with them. What I mean by that is, when I say water is H2O, I can tell you exactly how many atoms are in it. When I say a polymer has a molecular weight of a million, what I'm really talking about is the average molecular weight of, of a polymer. It's really a bell curve. And they have quite a few different polymer molecular weights in there. So it's all about averages. And it's that averages that makes the reliability of those materials very difficult. And the more reliable the material is, the harder it is to get it. And then, of course, to set up a plastics industry, you've got to have infrastructure and capital. And the type of equipment that processes polymers is expensive. The other problem is it has, a, it has an issue with its marketing. 
Um, I'll never refer to it as a plastic. I tend to refer to it as a polymer. That tends to be because polymers also have uh, a thing called plastic deformation, which makes it confusing if you call them plastic. So I stick with polymer. But plastic processing is not seen as a high-value manufacturing route. Again, because we're all so used to commodity plastics like our plastic bags. And plastic materials are not con conceived as uh, advanced materials. And hopefully, the next few minutes, I'm going to try to change your minds on that. So the first thing I'll talk about is additive manufacturing. Um, Ramesh here could answer all the questions tonight if I needed to. So uh, if I need backup or I look confused, I'll let him take over. Um, Additive manufacturing, rapid prototyping, 3D printing, these are all different terms that we use to, to talk about the same sort of process, effectively building up a 3D structured shape. Um, one of the interesting things about additive manufacturing that people don't know is it's actually based on a number of different techniques. So you can 3D print metals, you can 3D print plastics, you can 3D print ceramics. And indeed, you can do that using quite a lot of different techniques. I'm going to talk really briefly about three. So. Um, I really just wanted an excuse to shoehorn in a picture of a superhero movie. So um, that's, uh, that's a, fi a picture from one of the X-Men movies. And what's on his head, um, I'm sure it made sense in the movie, but in reality it was a 3D printed prop. So this goes to show that we're using 3D printing not just for prototyping, but for actual parts. In fact, uh, most of the Formula One industry, all the wheels are 3D printed, or all the uh, drivers... Um, steering wheels are 3D printed, and they're 3D printed because they can ergonomically match it to each driver, they can change the designs really quickly in between, and they can iterate over and over again. So I'll talk briefly about three different types of additive manufacturing. One is selective laser sintering. Um, there's a few polymers available for it, so polyamide 12 and 11, or as most people call them, nylon, uh, TPA and PEAK, and there are other materials in development. I'm probably lying to you a little bit because the TPEs have nearly always been developed already. They can be bought from a load of different manufacturers, and some of them come filled and some of them don't. And what I mean by filled is some of them have reinforcing agents in them. So laser sintering is sort of a process where, basically, depending on the particle size of the, pro uh, of the material, and you can get lots of different types of particle sizes depending on the polymer that you buy, you're basically heating it up with a laser and sintering it together. And the polymers that work best to be sintered are like nylon here. So if you look at a scan of nylon, and you don't need to understand what the scan says, up here is where the nylon has melted, and down here is where it's crystallized. And in this little middle space here, there's some room to maneuver, and that's where we can sinter. And the wider that space is, the easier it is to sinter a material. Nylon is quite a, quite a useful material um, for sintering because it's an engineering grade polymer. So it's used quite for a lot of hard applications. Um, Sorry, the screen's a little odd here, but uh, it gives me an excuse to talk about nylon really briefly. Um, the reason, anybody know the reason nylon's called nylon? I mean, all polymers have names like polyethylene, you know, polypropylene, but nylon is called nylon. And it's actually called polyamide. Uh, the ter term nylon comes from ladies' tights. They were invented in two places together, New York and London, and nylon became the name. They just added them together pointless piece of information, and I guarantee you later on tonight that's the only thing any of you will remember. <laughs> but anyway, um, so the, another mechanism for making polymers is uh, polymerization. So that's how we make polymers in the real world anyway. We polymerize them. What do you mean by polymerizing? So earlier on I said that polymers was from the Greek poly meaning many and mer meaning repeat unit. Or maybe I didn't say it, but I should have. Um, Monomers are what make up polymers. So you add monomers together to get polymers. Monomers are the individual molecules, and polymers are the long molecules. So when we polymerize something, we're starting a chemical reaction that's adding all those liquid monomers together to make a polymer. Now, we can do that on a huge scale in industry and make our polymer materials, which will go off to be used in medical plastics, or we can do it on a really small scale, where we use a laser. And that's what we do in SLS, or in polyjet printing, we do a slightly different variation of that. What we do is we use UV light, as well as an initiator, to cure a polymer in place. And so you have a vat of material, and everywhere the laser touches, you create a polymer. And anywhere it doesn't touch, you still have a liquid resin. So that's how you build up your 3D structure. It's just like an inkjet printer, except it's using a UV light to cure the resin that's there. Loads of different things affect how you cure it, which is why it's so complicated. The amount of energy you give it, the radiation, the speed, the atmosphere, the formulation of the resin you're buying, and then whether it's got a different color, 
whether it's got particles in it like fillers. So there's so many different variations of material you can use. And as a result, there's loads of different people making them. So you've got people like Envision, Laser, Objet, 3D Systems, and Stratsys. All of these people sell really expensive resin 3D printers. But also you can buy pretty cheap resin 3D printers. And those guys are three and a half to 4,000 euro each. And they all work on very small scales. The fundamental issue with 3D printing from an SLA model is you're using UV curing. What that means is you're creating something that has been UV cured. Downside of that is UVs around us all the time. There's UV coming from those lights, there's UV outside. Problem is if you leave a UV cured part on your table, over time it'll degrade. So it'll get more brittle, it'll turn a bit yellow, and it'll effectively go off. So these SLA materials are very, very good for getting really good models of materials, but they're not ideal for long-term parts. Now, some of these companies have been making great strides in changing that, and some of them have products that do that, but fundamentally the single biggest challenge in the SLA industry is the aging of the materials. The other one that's pretty interesting is this. It's the cheapest one, the one you'll probably be familiar with. Uh, depending on whose patent you read, it's called fused deposition modeling or fused filament fabrication. I really liked the alliteration. Um, so basically, you're taking a polymer strand like this, and you're melting it ever so slightly in the head of a 3D printer. And that 3D printer is drawing a pattern. These are the things that everyone's got in their own house at the moment. They're uh, very useful for making small models. They're very handy. And they're very cheap. Two or 3,000 euro, 30 quid for the filament. In those cases, the real science isn't so much in the printer, which is just an XYZ plotter, it's more in the filament. So you can choose what material you want to put in the filament. For example, you can look at personalized medicine, the idea of 3D printing your own tablets at home as long as the polymer filament has got a drug in it. You can look at 3D printing parts for your own printer. A lot of the printers come with the ability to 3D print their own parts in case their parts break. So very cheap, very useful. Downside to it is, because it's melting the polymer and leaving it down in a strand, it's all leaving the polymer in one direction, which isn't a boy band, is a simple one direction. Okay? Um, now, the thing about that is, and I, I actually give you all permission later on tonight, go find a vending machine, I know it's January, and buy any chocolate bar of your choice. Doesn't matter which one. Actually, buy two. Uh, on the first one, just rip it open like you normally would. Really easy to rip open. Second one, Try ripping it open sideways. Really difficult. No matter which one of you and how you've been to the gym, it's going to be really hard. The reason for that is, when we blow the plastic to make the film, the corms the packaging, all those polymer chains are all going in one direction. And they're not going in the other direction. So you're, when you're ripping across the side, you're effectively trying to rip across those chains. It's very difficult. And if you're ripping down through them, it's very easy. Fused filament fabrication has the same issues, in the sense that once you make the part, it doesn't have the same strength in every direction. It has strength in different directions. So that's one of the downsides of that type of material. People often ask about 3D printing, you know, oh, it's a big buzzword, no one's really doing anything with it, you know, is there anybody making products? Again, for metal printing, I'll point you to, to Ramesh, and he can tell you all about the metal parts that are made from that. But from the plastic parts, there's loads. So everyone's probably heard of Invisalign. These idea, these braces you put in to fix your teeth. This was founded in 1997. It's now a $4.4 billion company. It's huge. And what they do is they fundamentally use SLA to make their tooling patterns. Because every single Invisalign brace set is individual. So it's not, it's not, it's not financially feasible to make that every time out of tool steel. So you 3D print your, te your, te your teeth mold, you then make your, your different implant, and you send it off to the person, and you throw away the mold, and you start again, over and over again. They have a bank of 40 machines. Actually, since I wrote this, they've probably got 50 or 60. And they're constantly in use, 24-7, making individualized, personalized implants for every single person who wants them. This is an example of not using 3D printing to make a prototype, not make, using it to show something that's shiny, to actually make something that's functional. Another great example is hearing aids. 90% of all hearing aid shells are created using stereolithography. I don't mean 90% in Ireland, I mean 90% worldwide. So this is already happening. This is only possible because we do have biocompatible polymers that can be 3D printed. So these are a disposable medical device. We don't think of them that way, but they are. You can make this in under a day, and 
there's about 10 million 3D printed hearing aids in circulation today. Again, that number is probably lowballing it. So this is another application where you've got 3D printing making medical parts that are actually in use, not being used as a demonstrator. In 2007, Siemens claimed the US 50% uh, of the hearing aids that they produced were made using additive manufacturing. That number now, 10 years later, is closer to 90%. So from a production point of view, what are the advantages of additive manufacturing? Well, reduction in tooling, that's really important because you don't need a tool if you're 3D printing something. Agile manufacturing operations, again with the big words and the pointless sentences, but basically what I mean by that is you don't have to have a big machine that's dedicated to making something. You can have a machine that can make a number of different parts really quickly. And decentralized manufacturing is an important idea. So imagine instead of having to sell your part, uh, build your part, and then ship your part to Korea to be assembled, the guy in the stock room in Korea simply bought the design, plugged it into his 3D printer, and printed a part every time he needed it. And every time he needed it, he paid you for it. So that's the idea of decentralized manufacturing. Reduction in inventory and part consolidation. Again, the idea here that you don't need to have every part on stock. You can print them in, at the time. The term that we keep using in additive manufacturing is that complexity is free. What that means is, if you want to make a mold in traditional injection molding for plastics, the more complex the mold, the higher the expense of the tooling. In additive manufacturing, to, to print a complex part versus printing a non-complex part, there's no difference. You're still 3D printing it, so it's just as easy. Lightweighting and lattice structures are kind of the same thing. So when you injection mold a plastic part, unless you use something like water-assisted injection molding or gas-assisted injection molding, you're molding a solid part. When you 3D print something, you can print a solid skin, but you can build up a lattice structure inside. So like a beehive, like octagons or whatever sort of shape you want, they will reinforce the part, but it doesn't mean the part has to be full. You can save material, you can lightweight material, and you have just the same strength. So I wanted to try and give an example of how this is used. So um, two of my colleagues in Atlone uh, did some work a while back. Um, I think they were bored or we weren't working them hard enough, so I'll, I'll mention their names. Uh, it was Michael Hopkins, our a lead injection molding engineer, and Connor Hayes, who's our senior designer. Um, basically, they wanted to see how quick could they go from sitting in office to having parts in their hands from an injection molding process. So what they did was they had a quick look at the idea of making a USB stick. Simple USB stick, we'd buy the electronic parts in, we happen to have them, and we'd use an overmolding process to make the USB covers. So on the Thursday, early morning, they sat around for five hours designing the idea of putting an AIT logo on it, putting a logo for a conference we were attending on it, and designing that. Took a little bit of time. Then they plugged into Moldflow, checked to make sure the tooling worked, and really quickly designed the different parts they wanted. Overnight, they printed the parts, the various inserts for the injection mold tooling. They gave them a light sanding, UV cured the outside. These were all using SLA. So again, that UV curing process I talked about a little bit about earlier. And then afterwards, they put them in our injection molding machine. It's a little hard to see there, but on my screen, it looks lovely, by the way. Um, so what you've got here, as you can barely see, is two 3D printed inserts in a standard injection molding machine insert. And then we injection molded it. And here you have one of our parts with the two inserts. So we were doing two up molding within a day and a half, two days. And it's very difficult to see, but you can see a little bit of browning around these gates here. So one of the issues with using SLA printed insert molds is they're only going to last for a certain amount of time. In this case, I think we've got about 100 parts out of it. So depending on the resin you use to 3D print, you're going to have a longer turnaround time. You could ask, why is this important for medical molding? One of the biggest issues in medical molding is a regulatory process. So it's really important you use a regulatory approved resin to make your parts. With traditional additive manufacturing, not all of the 3D printed resins are regulatory approved. In fact, very few of them are, which means it's very difficult to make a functional medical device part. Of course, we're making these parts already with injection molding. So if you flip the idea of 3D printing on its head, and instead you 3D print the tooling, and you don't 3D print the part, and then you use the tooling in an injection molding process, you can use your regulatory approved resin in your injection molding machine and make your parts in your regulatory proof resin, and they can be used for testing. And this hugely cuts down on turnaround time and cost of using a traditional injection mold tool. 
This is an idea of the worldwide 3D printing industry. The forecast is only going in one direction. And it's going in one direction because, again, this idea of the material and the equipment has reached a certain amount of maturity. We're far from, far from having the ideal 3D printing systems, but they're getting better and better. And more importantly, they're getting cheaper and cheaper. Now a lot of companies have them in-house for their own designing, for their own prototyping. A lot of companies are doing their own 3D printing. And soon you're going to see larger machines and more complex machines going out into the work, into the industry. So I'll continue to waffle aimlessly at Industry 4.0 now. Uh, this is another one of those big catchwords that people keep using, and nobody seems to know what exactly it means. Um, industry 4.0 basically is the next industrial revolution. I'll explain that properly in a minute. Um, but basically, it's talking about the idea of using advanced sensors, advanced equipment, and the cloud-based data integration to try to evolve the way we're doing things. So what do I mean by a new industrial revolution? Well, the first one, basically, end of the 18th century, you've got steam appearing. We have the industrial revolution. Now, we've, all of a sudden, things are being made. After that, we've got another one, where all of a sudden, now we've got cheap electricity. Things are becoming electrically produced. Now we've got mass production. After that, now we've got electronics and in IT infrastructure starting to be used. So we've got to where we are today. We've got to things like systems integration, things like where you can, oh, you can follow a part around your factory. Where we're getting now is into this final Industry 4.0, what we call cyber-physical systems, where not only is your machinery talking to other machinery, it's talking to other machinery on the other side of the world. It's also talking to the parts it's creating, and those parts are talking back. So the idea that these machines are working autonomously to iterate through the process. And how it's doing that is it's doing that by data integration. So as we have it at the moment, all of the really complex machines we already have, they're all creating loads of data. But oftentimes, that data is sitting on them, and it's not actually being used for anything. So in these cases, we're going to use that data, and we're going to mine the data and try to make these parts talk to each other and bring in this idea of really smart manufacturing. So if I look at sort of injection molding as an example, um, servo drives are almost indisp indispensable now in new machinery systems. Multi-component molding is more important. So when I say multi-component molding, um, MGS Limited make these parts, and uh, these are just example parts, but you've got three different separate polymers molded together in one process. This is not, this would have been uncommon five years ago, and is now a lot more common. So this idea cuts down on assembly time, assembly cost. It also cuts down on failures due to misassemblies. Controls are starting to adopt on machinery, adopting things that are much more like our phones. So beforehand, we wouldn't have had multi-touch gestures, the idea of using more than one finger, more than one button, and now using gestures, so doing something with two or three fingers as opposed to one finger. And now the machineries are coming with stored libraries of data. Um, the example I always give is, if any of you are familiar with Moleflow, Moleflow is a simulation tool used to check how, a, how an injection mold tool will fill. And you've got to fill in some information about the viscosity of the polymer, the polymer properties, and it'll tell you, will this mold design make your part? When I started using that process first in about uh, 2001, uh, roughly, it was really complex. Filling in anything took hours. It was a real, really, really difficult idea. Now, if you plug into, if you turn on Moleflow, you choose from a drop-down menu, and it'll you let you choose which injection molding machine you're using. All the suppliers have given them information. It let you choose which resin you're using. A lot of the resin manufacturers have given them information. So the process is much easier because that data is available. So connectivity now is a huge part of that. So no more are machines being built to be single individual standalone devices. They're being built to be integrated into a factory. So here's some examples just from this year. Um, again, I'm just talking about injection molding as an example, but this could be applied to basically any of the plastics industries. So if you look at some of the different manufacturers, Krauss Maffei, who makes injection molding machines, they're working on a thing called Krauss Maffei Analytics. Um, they've, they've given demos of this, but I don't think it's quite ready just yet. Basically, they're taking all the data off the machines that you can use, and they're trying to streamline the ways you optimize that manufacturing process. The idea being you can walk around with your tablet and look at different Krauss Maffei machines in your factory and get all that data in one go. Engel, who are another massive injection molding machine, have just bought an Austri Austrian company that work in MES. And um, 
MES's Manufacturing Execution System, which again is a needless acronym for just making things work together better. They're basically a software company who work on trying to integrate the production process. Arberg's All-Rounder, which was at K this year, has a, a Gestica controller, which is a really fancy way of saying it looks like an iPad. It behaves like an iPad. You can use multiple fingers, multiple... This was new to the entire industry. A couple of years ago, none of this would have happened with your big old dials and big hard clunking toggles to move around. What's also important is it uses fingertip control to actually fine control the machine's movements. All of this is adding more and more functionality to the machines. TSM, who are based here in Ireland, They've looked at a new business information system. So what TSM do is they make the blenders and the feeders that sit on top of these machines and feed them the polymer. And what, one of the big challenges for them is making sure they feed exactly the right amount of polymer in exactly the right ratio at exactly the right time. And now it's not just enough that they're really good at that job. Now they have to be able to send that data off in the cloud and integrate with all the other information coming from the machines. And this is a small company in Drada, and they're working on this right now, and they're probably leading the field. This is in the next five years, it's a little difficult to see, but in the next five years, what exactly are companies in the medical device space looking at putting in place? So 39.55% of them are manufacturing execution systems, so software systems. Most of them already have those sort of things. They already use statistical process control. They already have some sort of lab monitoring system. They already have some sort of computer-aided manufacturing system. Some of the men, about 18% of them are looking at product lifecycle management. The really interesting one, though, is the 18%. And that's the guys looking at augmented reality. They're looking at really, uh, really important cloud manufacturing. The idea of taking all that information off those machines, sending it up into the cloud, and being available at the fingerprints of engineers all over the world. Biggest problem in an approach like that is the top thing, is cybersecurity. Because once you send your data somewhere, you've got to be really careful that it's controlled. So sticking on injection molding, I'll talk a little bit about micromolding for a second. And um, micromolding is an interesting process because it means two things. And depending on who you're talking to, they always take it as one or the other. So micromolding means making micro parts, which means micro weight, or injection molding to micro resolutions. So there are certain things that control the amount of resolution you can get to on a part. Those things are things like the finish on the injection mold tool, things like the surface energy of the polymer you're injection molding, things like the actual design and how the polymer gets there. All these things affect the micromolding. Micromolding has become really popular in recent years, not only because it's a very robust process, but because you can make very, very small parts, which means you can take these micromolds, micromolding machines, cells, you can put them in line together and make very small assemblies. Um, they're typically used for things that we call minimally invasive devices. So if you can imagine a very, very, very small part being molded, that very small part actually needs to be molded for very small tolerances. Now, a large injection molding machine is going to have real trouble controlling its motors down to those fine tolerances. So a small micromolder is, is the best way to do it. Most injection molding machines just use a simple screw, a reciprocating screw, to injection mold the plastic. So the plastic fills in one side, it gets heated, the screw turns, moves back, and then injects that molten plastic into the mold. On the other side, micromolding tends to move away from that a little bit, mainly due to really small screws mean those screws can be broken really easily. So what they tend to use is they use a plasticization and a plunger assembly. So some of them, depending on the person designing the micromold, so you've got people like Boy, people like Cincinnati Millicron, people like Babyplast, all use slightly different approaches to how they inject the plastic into the mold. But in most cases, they're using two assemblies. They're using one to meter the amount of polymer they want to use, and they're typically using a plunger to push it into the mold afterwards. Okay? One of the tricks with these materials is fillers. So you think in the plastics industry, traditionally, fillers were used to make things cheaper. So uh, if you didn't want to use all polymer in your part, because polymer is expensive, maybe you throw in a bit of talc or something, you'd still have the same properties, but you'd cut down on the overall cost. So a couple of examples of where fillers, though, have been used for the right reasons, because they're actually being used to functionally help the part. The classic example is, um, anyone ever seen those old 1930s mobster movies? People are driving around in white wall rimmed tires. Great things. Anyone wonder why there's no white rim tires around today? 
The answer is they don't have carbon black in them. Rubber is very unstable in UV light. So carbon black, which is a really cheap filler, is put into rubber, makes all our tires black, but also protects them from UV damage. If you use white wall tires, they get very brittle very quick because they're not protected by that carbon black and they basically fall apart. So they'd fail every single quality test or safety test we'd ever do on them today. But back then, they looked cool. So another example in the medical industry is things that make things radiopaque. So what I mean by radiopaque is they have a high electron density. When you look at an X-ray, uh, an X-ray just really shows the difference in electron density between things. And unfortunately for our bodies, plastic isn't hugely different to polymers. So this is a catheter that is used for, um, well, this is a, happens to be a neurological catheter, and there's a, it might be difficult to see from up there, but there's a tiny little stent semi-deployed on the very end. Now, when someone's putting this into you, you want to make sure that they know where it is and where it's going. So they fill it with a radiopaque material, an electron-dense material, something like bismuth oxychloride or barium sulfate. It doesn't really matter what it is. But it tends to be a material that can be seen under an X-ray. So it's very, very different to your body. Problem with materials like that is they have particle sizes. So if you think about an injection molded polymer, it's a liquid. By the time it's being injection molded, it's a liquid. But a filler like that, a radiopaque filler like that, is a solid. And it's got to flow through all these very small passageways. And in a micromolded part, those very small passageways are smaller than on a lot of other parts. And thus, fillers can have some issues with clogging. And they actually can be a problem for using in micromolded in micro assemblies. One of the more interesting things to come out of K was the idea of ultrasonic molding. I'll just really touch very briefly on this. But ultrasonic um, treatment of plastics has been used in the industry for decades. And it's been used to weld parts together. Effectively, you put two pieces of plastic together. You put ultrasonic energy through them. And at the interface, they melt and they stick together. That's the most basic uh, idea of it. In ultrasonic molding, you're effectively using that ultrasonic energy to mold, to make the polymer molten, make it flow, and fill apart. There's a small company in Barcelona called Ultrasion that had, a, had some machines there to show. And this is an example they get, did where they were making a retina eye surgery tip. The final part had to weigh 0.1 of a gram. So if you can imagine the tiny weights that's being involved there, but also the high requirement for reproducibility. The most important thing, though, is the actual design of the part meant you had to use two very small core pins. What that means is there's two very small pins that fit in the part and you're molding around. If you were to use a traditional micromolding process, the pressures involved there would have snapped those pins in half. But because the ultrasonic molding process had much lower pressures, it was able to mold them. Now, obviously, this was an advertising piece for them, so they were only going to give us the good examples. But the idea here being that injection molding as a process hasn't really changed over the last 30 years. We're effectively still doing the same things. Yes, we're doing it with more precise controls and better, con uh, better human machine interfaces, but we're effectively still doing the same thing. It's things like ultrasonic injection molding, things like what Cincinnati Millicron are doing with their micromolder. It's those sort of approaches that are changing the ways that the molding process is being used and will continue to change the way the process is used into the future. So I'm going to talk a little bit, because I mentioned the catheter, about coatings and stents. Uh, it's an interesting thing, because stents are a complex, uh, a complex part. Effectively, they just look a bit like chicken wire. They're there to hold up your arteries. Um, you can have lots of different types of stents. So peripheral stents, stents that are below the knee, stents for your gastrointestinal tract, stent for your brain. All of these stents, fundamentally, their job is to hold open your veins and arteries if they've been occluded by some fat. Over the years, we've had the stents have designed, their evolution has designed. We started off with bare metal stents. Those stents were put into your body, they held open your arteries, but your body really didn't like having a piece of metal implanted in it, so it rebelled. And when it rebelled, it tried to attack it, and it built up some fat and some tissue around it. So then we moved into the idea of coating those stents with polymers. And not just any polymer. First, you coated them with biocompatible polymers. Those polymers made them look a little bit more like the body. And they were good. And then we coated them with polymers that controlled a drug. And that drug was slowly released from the polymer while it was in situ. And that was even better, because it helped remove any inflammation. So you've got an example here of 
different strut designs from stents. So it's pretty difficult to see, but on the very end of this is a really small stent. Well, actually, that's a lie. It's a pretty large stent. But uh, that kind of chicken wire type material, which is very hard to see, is a stent. And the strut thickness is really important because the strut is what's in contact with your body. So you can see, depending on the manufacturer, some of a polymer coating the whole way around, some of a polymer coating only on the little bit that's actually physically touching your, your body. And over the years, the strut thickness has gone down until now. And I'll explain why in a second. In terms of the coatings, you've got two different types of coatings here. One's a durable coating and one's a biodegradable coating. So a durable coating basically means the coating stays where it is. It doesn't dissolve in your body. In your body, though, it does swell a little bit. And while it's swollen, it slowly releases the drug into your system. Biodegradable coating, it completely dissolves over a period of time. And as it dissolves, it releases the drug into your system. One of the requirements in the medical device industry for coatings like this, or for anything that degrades in your body is, well, when I say degrade, where does it go? So for the regulatory authorities, you have to be able to say exactly where it goes. For those of you who did biology and leaving cert, I'll mention the Krebs cycle to give you all flashbacks. But the Krebs cycle is, is how your kidneys remove waste from your body. And in the case of PLLA, which is a common coating material, that's one of the ways it's excreted from the body. And for a manufacturer to have a polymer approved for use in the body that is going to biodegrade, they need to be able to explain exactly how the material is removed from your body. So one of the big breakthroughs has been this idea of a biodegradable stent. So a biodegradable stent, instead of a metal stent, the whole stent dissolves and disappears over time. Now, you can have some metals that dissolve in your body, but I don't want to frighten you too much. Uh, but plastics are much more friendly, so we'll focus on them. Now, you might think, oh, but this stent was holding my artery open. Why the hell would I want it to dissolve? Well, the thing is, over time, if that stent's in your body, your skin and your vein might start to slowly grow through it, and that opening might start to get blocked again. But now you can't put back in a stent because there's already a stent there. So the only way to, get to, to fix that problem is to take the previous stent out, which unfortunately involves surgery. Placement of a stent at the moment is usually pretty painless. Generally, a stent like this is actually put in through the leg or somewhere nice and easy, very far away from its point of action and is threaded to the point using an x-ray. However, to remove a stent that's already there, unfortunately, is a little bit more violent. They've got to cut into you and remove the stent. A biodegradable stent solves that problem. Over a, few, over a few months or even years, the stent slowly dissolves and disappears. Then the doctor knows it's gone and simply puts another one back in. And they repeat this process over and over again. Sounds wonderful. Why are there drawbacks? Well, the first one's obvious. It's a plastic, so it's not quite as strong as a metal. So you can see over time the trend in strut thicknesses has gone down. Now all of a sudden we've got a biodegradable stent. It's got a bigger strut thickness again. So you've got to put more plastic in to get the same mechanical properties out. So if I worked for Abbott, I'd be telling you how wonderful their biodegradable stent is. But I don't, so I'm not going to. I'm going to tell you the truth. And the truth is, it ain't working all that well. <laughs> uh, so basically, there are a few challenges with biodegradable stents. And Abbott unfortunately found out this year. One of the challenges is it didn't outperform a metal stent. And they were really hoping it would. Now, there's a lot of different trials done and a lot of different reasons given. Um, the guys in charge of Abbott uh, gave an interesting interview to say, well, they found out there was a lot of problems in manufacturing the material. And they figured a lot of them out after they'd made the parts to make the trial samples. So they kind of expected them to be not quite as good. And that's a fair point. But there's a couple of different challenges to making a biodegradable stent. Like all polymers, it has to be sterilized. But sterilization in polymers has a lot of different effects. One of the effects it has is it can make them brittle. Um, so you can affect it by sterilizing it. So you can make the best medical device in the world and then sterilize it and effectively half the properties it would have had beforehand. Another thing is production optimization. When you're dealing with such small quantities of material and such small parts, tiny variances make huge differences. And we are not very tolerant to tiny differences. And the other thing is raw material costs. If we think of a 
an expensive medical polymer. So I'll use PBAX from Archema as an example. It's used in a lot of catheters, costs about 27, 28 euro a kilo, maybe a little bit more. The PLA I mentioned for the 3D printed stent, or for the bioabsorbable stent, anybody want to guess how much that costs? Go oh, on, throw a number out somebody. Give me something. It's going to be too low. 1,200 euro a kilo. So it's not cheap. Now, of course, the argument is, if you're getting a stent that weighs a kilo into your body, that's a really big stent. So that's not going to happen. But at the same time, that's a huge amount of cost on a very small amount of material. Traditionally, when you're starting up an injection molding machine or an extruder, you could purge out a couple of kilos into the ground pretty easily just to set the machine up. You can't do it in a process like this. And there's that method of elimination from the body again. Why I'm mentioning it again is, when you think of these materials, you have to think about how difficult is it to get a new material. So there are really only four or five materials that are approved for these sort of applications. And this is true of all medical plastics. The problem is, when you're coming up with a new product, the manager of the factory looks down the floor and he says to himself, well, we've got line seven and eight are already set up to use this material, so let's use that one again. And these seven materials are approved by the FDA or whatever regulatory authority to be used. So we'll continue to use those. It's very difficult to innovate the new types of materials. And for material suppliers, it's very difficult for them to come out with new grades of materials because there's a lot of cost involved up front. Putting those materials through all those regulatory uh, loopholes just to get them approved, hoping that a company will buy them. And the other issue, of course, is length of time. So if I were to ask you guys about the shoes you were wearing 10 years ago, you'd probably say, oh, I have no idea. You certainly don't know where the polymers that came from the soles of those materials are, and the companies who sold those soles are probably long gone out of business. In the medical device industry, though, a 10 or 15 year design life is normal. So not only do you have to make a part that you're going to look after for 15 years, you have to make sure this person who's supplying you those materials is still going in 15 years' time. And that's quite a challenge. So rather than continue to bore the Jesus out of you, I'll end with some final thoughts. Resin availability, cost, security, and supply. Again, that's my, the same point I just made. But one of the interesting things is there's different requirements in different countries. So I mentioned earlier that a, a formulation for a polymer is generally not known to the customer, or sometimes they only know bits of it. Problem is, a company can supply the same polymer resin to the same companies in two different countries but supply them slightly different formulations because the regulatory reasons in each country might be different. So for instance, maybe you can get an animal-based stabilizer in one country, but that's outlawed in another and you have to use a plant-based stabilizer. Now, you're still buying the same packet of material, or so you think, but you're actually making a different resin. So this is a re very real challenge for the plastics industry. Uh, I love this final point because it's, it's aging populations and increased expectations. You know, 15, 20 years ago, if you got a hip implant, you got it at 70, you thought, okay, I'll sit in my chair and probably die at 75, you know. Um, now, people are getting hip implants in their 50s, and they want to go climbing cliffs a year later. The design life of a hip implant is about 10 years. The doctors know that. They give you a hip implant, they're thinking, if you're under 50, you're going to be back. So you have to understand that these medical devices are getting more and more difficult to manufacture because people expect more and more out of them. We don't expect to just sit in a corner anymore. We expect the medical devices to move with us. Impact of a changing marketplace. I was going to try and get through today without mentioning, mentioning Brexit or Trump, and then I thought, I'll leave it to the last slide. Um, so it's a very unstable environment at the minute. We don't really know where a lot of these companies are going to go or where a lot of these materials are going to go, more importantly. So this changing marketplace, it's not really going to affect the polymer medical device industry, but it might affect the broader medical industry. And that's something to keep in mind. The other thing is this idea of digital health and wearables. It's really only starting now. You see a lot of people who are runners wearing, you know, again, heart rate monitors and all this sort of stuff. But over time, people are going to become more and more used to these ideas of having instant feedback on how their body is. And all of these materials are going to be medical machines. They're not going to be simple material because they're in contact with your skin. Um, a famous case is actually Fitbit. I don't know if any of you have heard of Fitbit, but they, they make small little heart rate monitors, etc., etc., aimed mostly at people who are very active, not like me. But those Fitbit monitors had a really big problem about two years ago. They made a band, 
like any watch band, supposed to be sweat proof that you could wear in the gym. It ended up irritating quite a lot of people. So it irritated their skin. This is a classic issue of a medical device being in contact with the skin all the time. And they didn't understand the requirements of the body. They think we'll just stick any old strap on it and it'll be fine. They actually had an issue with the polymer not being tolerated by the people involved. So the whole wearables and digital health environment is going to shape a lot of where medical devices come and go from the next few years. And then lastly, the European medical plastic market. Between now and 2024, basically everything is going up. This is in um, millions of tons on the end. Uh, so the idea of it's constantly going up. These are the individual polymers I mentioned earlier. As you can see, every single grade of polymer is expected to grow in the next seven or eight years. And what that means is if all the grades of polymer are growing, then all the parts are growing. One final point would be that at the minute we have an industry that's focused on mass production. It's pretty unlikely in 10 years' time we will continue to have a mass production focused environment. There's going to be a huge aim towards more bespoke, personalized medical devices. The idea being that if you're in surgery and you have a critical size defect in a bone, you will get to a point where the doctor wants a part that only fits your bone. The idea of him 3D scanning that hole and 3D printing an implant in place is no longer something for the future. It's actually out there. It's happening now. You've got companies all over the world looking in this area, and many of them will succeed in the next 15 years. The idea being medical plastics is only going to grow, but perhaps the shape of the industry will have changed entirely by the time you're all back here in 10 years' time. And that is it. Thank you very much. Sean, thanks very much. If I could just maybe ask you to hold your questions. I know there's lots on nylon, One Direction, Brexit, Trump, and whatever else that we talked about. But I'd just like to introduce um, um, Mark Kelleher from the Biomedical Division to give a short presentation just on behalf of the division, I think. Exactly. Yeah. And then we'll have uh, general questions, answers for our questions, and maybe answers from both Sh Sean and uh, Mark. Over yeah, to thanks. you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Before I begin, just a request there from Mary. Could you all make sure you've signed the uh, sign in sheet, please, before you leave? Thank you. Okay, folks, my name is Mark Keller. I'm vice chair of the uh, Biomedical Engineering Division of Engineers Ireland uh, tonight, and I've got a hard act to follow after Sean, so thanks for that, Sean. But um, so I'll speak very briefly about the division, who we are and what we do, and give you a quick idea on some upcoming events we have planned for the next uh, month or two as well. The Biomed Engineering Division, uh, BED, was founded as a sector back in 1998, and after a lot of hard work and uh, Lobbying got uh, transferred to a full division of the uh, biomedical of the engineers around back in 2002. I think it's fair enough. I think people realised back then how important the biomedical engineering uh, industry in Ireland was. And as Sean, alluded, <coughs> excuse me, alluded to in his uh, presentation, you see the number of companies we have here. I believe there's uh, about 450 companies involved in medical technology in Ireland. But half of those are indigenous, and I think it's 17 of the top 20 companies in the world have a presence here at the moment. So. The purpose of the uh, BED, Biomedical Engineering Division, is to provide a professional and social network for uh, engineers in biomedical engineering. I think it's fair to say it's very much a uh, multidisciplinary, very collaborative uh, industry to work in. Because you think of it um, to address unmet clinical needs and to provide innovative solutions to work to, to uh, meet these uh, clinical needs. You need people with, from a strong engineering background, from the traditional engineering disciplines such as software engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical and electronic, and so on. We also need to bring in people from the medical sciences, from experience, uh, knowledge of um, physiology and anatomy, and so on. So the overall idea of the BED is that you provide a, a forum, an opportunity for people to network, and also provides uh, education, the training courses, and seminars like the ones uh, we're attending, all attending right now. That's the general idea of the uh, BED. There are two specific activities I'd like to go through in some detail as well, just briefly. There is the uh, Biomedical Engineering Division Research Medal. This is a medal, an annual award, started back in 2002. And it's awarded to PhD students who've made a significant contribution to the field of biomedical engineering research. The idea of it really is to highlight the good work that's being done in this area and also to encourage undergraduates to uh, consider postgraduate work in biomedical engineering as well. They started back in 2002. Since 2009, 
the award, the actual award of the medal itself, uh, is has been combined with a conference, the Bioengineering in Ireland Conference, which is run by the uh, Royal Academy of uh, Medicine in Ireland. The second uh, activity I'd like to discuss is the 2016-2017 uh, Higher Education Program. Tonight's presentation is part of that plan. It's organised by Dr. Dasuna Kohur, who's one of the uh, members of the committee and, and the BED. The idea is to promote uh, biomedical engineering and uh, make students in particular aware of the opportunities that are available in, in the industry. And again, it gives an opportunity for people, for contact between industry representatives, students and faculty in the field of biomedical engineering. It's probably fair to say in the past that it was quite Dublin-centric, a lot of events in the uh, higher education programme were focused around Dublin, but it was a conscious decision this year to try and bring it out because, again, as Sean alluded to, there's quite a distribution of uh, biomedical engineering companies um, in various clusters around the country, for example, in Cork, in Limerick and Galway, uh, to give some examples. So briefly, some events being held around the country. The next couple of events in the near future. 8th of February in the uh, University of Ulster in Jordanstown is a seminar on sensor technologies to promote, promote well-being. On the 22nd of February in NUI Galway, there's a medical device design from a clinical perspective a seminar. And finally, on the 23rd of March in LIT, there's a focus on active and plantable medical devices. That's it for me. Thank you. The full uh, details of the BED are available on the link there on the website. So I encourage all of you. And here's a call to action. I encourage anybody uh, actively involved in the biomedical engineering industry who is considering a career in that, please get involved and, uh, and take part. Thank you. So this stage is just gone seven. So we might have just uh, maybe five or ten minutes for questions, if that's OK. I'm sure people have a number of questions for Sean's wonderful speech and indeed maybe some questions on the whole biomedical engineering division and where that's going as well. Uh, it's interesting just listening to companies. You said 450 companies, I think you mentioned. Yeah, which is, and, and Ireland is amazing. It's sort of out of kilter with a lot of the world in terms of we have a high number of these companies and indeed the, the plastics industry generally polymers. So it's a very interesting aspect to life in, w, in, Waterford, uh, sorry, in, the, in the country and indeed in Waterford. Uh, so has anybody got any question that maybe for either of the speakers, particularly for Sean? Yes. Sean, yeah, just in relation there, you're saying about, um, I suppose the government's been involved. You know, would it play much of a role in in the likes of the 3D printing and uh, where models are made and obviously what what they're made up of as well? You were saying you gave the example of like, uh, you know, some countries might be happy with an animal-based product, whereas other countries would want to plant. Based, you know, should they, you know, I suppose, should they, what should they do to streamline well, it? I, I think in Ireland, um, we're, we're kind of, we're, we're trapped in the sense that, and it's a good thing, in the sense that because the medical device are in Ireland, we export our products all over the world. So it's, it's not really about Irish regulations, it's about making sure that our products meet the most stringent regulations in whatever country they're being shipped into. So in general, you're looking at countries like Japan and America and Europe have its own requirements. So we have to make sure that our products meet all of those requirements, because otherwise, you know, we wouldn't get very far selling medical devices to Ireland. We have to sell them worldwide. Hey, Sean. Uh, what about plastics, waste, and recycling um, going forward? Because it's... It's, 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 it's a big area. I mean, in Ireland, you actually have huge recycling companies already. There's companies like Shabra and, um, well, Shabra are massive uh, for recycling. Polyolefins are traditionally the ones that are recycled the most. So polyolefins being things like polyethylene and polypropylene. Medical device recycling is a much more tricky yeah. uh, proposition because of the chance of it being contaminated. And also, because of the complexity of the parts. I mean, you've got parts like this that have three different resins in it, very difficult to separate very difficult to get any value out of them afterwards. So it is a challenge. But again, I would say that in terms of tonnages of plastics created, the medical device industry is small. It's a very high value industry, but it doesn't actually make large volume parts. Whereas things like the automotive industry, yeah. they're making very big parts and recycling those is an even bigger challenge because they tend to be you know, composites with fiberglass or whatever else. And that's a very tricky material to, to recycle. Recycling and medical devices, I would still err on the side of just destroying them. Yeah. That would be the answer. But again, in terms of the overall polymer recycling problem, medical devices are a very small part of it, purely because of this, the, the actual volume of parts. 
is much smaller. See, I skillfully didn't actually answer your question there. <laughs> okay. Is there anybody else? Sorry, Mary. <laughs> Just, uh, just while we're passing over the microphone, the population is interesting. The, the stats for Ireland, where we did a census recently, was as 4.76 or 4. Point, so 4.76 million in the country at the moment. It's due to go to 6 million by 2040. So, but the overall global population is 7.4 billion, and it's due to hit 8 billion or 11 billion, I should say, by the turn of the century, the next turn of the next. So really, if the population is going up and up and up, and we're all living longer, these devices and, and these issues about recycling and re—they're they're huge for everybody, really. And, and all the students involved here, I don't know. The, the, the pace of change is scary in one way, but it's exciting in another way as well. Uh, and indeed, um, I don't know. But then that's in the face of the regulatory affairs, which is interesting to me. That actually holds back innovation to a certain extent as well. You know, so that's a real challenge for the industry. Sorry, apologies. I've just interrupted. Yeah, hello, uh, Ulick Safford from Boston Scientific. No, I just had a question to do with the additive parts, for, especially for implantable medical devices. I could see how you could probably get some different materials, both metal and plastics, for SLS products. But are there any SLA resins and processes that you know of that are approved for any implantable use? Not to the best of my knowledge that are approved yet. Um, there has been, there's actually recently been, uh, the first 3D printed tablet has been approved uh, for use. Um, I'm not sure, the problem with photopolymerization in general, um, which is what SLA is made from, is that no photopolymerization process is 100% efficient. So when you cure the materials and you make them, by the nature of the fact that you're curing a polymer resin, those monomers, they want to react with things. But maybe they won't react 100%. They might react to 95, 96%, which means that 4% that's left over is a little toxic. So you've got to wash that material out before you can use it. Proving that those, all those materials is gone is a difficult job. Um, so it's a challenge, certainly. Ramesh? Yeah. Maybe we can just I talk. I think we'll hear you. Yeah. No, actually, this is, a, this is more of a question for you. In spite of the prevalent, like, prevalent use of these polymers and then uh, all industries, like, why there are a less take or why the academic institutes are not offering more of polymer graduates or something like that? There is only now the AIT is offering, and whoever comes out, the AIT takes away themselves or take away, right? Why is it um, there is not many academic institutes are offering more polymer courses, and why the why there is not much awareness from the school perspective here? Yeah. Why is it? That's really the question. Uh, is just why is not our universities and uh, institutes of technology not responding by yeah, creating exactly. more courses and so on? Yeah. It's an excellent question. I don't know the answer. It might have I can, I can have a go at it. Uh, <laughs> there's there's two, two, two main reasons, Ramesh. Um, one is, honestly, the average price of a qualified polymer engineer is pretty significant. So it's a, it's a, it's a pay cut to come back to lecturing. Second is the capital requirements to run a polymer Pro, uh, to run a polymer centre is very expensive. So, to own, for uh, for to to source undergraduates, for if you take us as an example, to treat injection moulding, we have to have seven injection moulding machines. The injection moulding machine cost, say it's a hundred thousand each, is not actually that expensive compared to the tooling costs, and then there's the upkeep of those, and that's only injection moulding. Then you've got to go to extrusion for the catheters. If you're going to have multi-lumen, multi-layer catheters like that, you're probably talking another couple of hundred thousand to have that sort of equipment. We, again, have nine extruders. None of those are cheap. None of the download screen equipment is cheap. So the amount of capital needed to invest in a project like that is pretty expensive. So it's difficult for other colleges to, to catch up. In, in the sense of AIT, we've been doing polymers since the 1970s, since long before. So we've sort of slowly, incrementally built it. The, the industry as a whole, desperately needs more graduates. Hopefully the apprenticeship course is launching between ourselves and SLIG will, will, will help with that. But it is a problem, and I wish more colleges would. It, it's not a case of AIT feeling competitive. We're not. We would love for more people to come out to the industry because it's desperately needed. Is it a perception problem as well in terms of plastics and so on? Yeah, we, we, I do a lot of school visits um, with our department to convince people to go into it. So how I was convinced, I suppose, is uh, I sat in Leaving Cert in a small school in Mayo and somebody came down and sat in, from AIT and said, 100% employment, everyone, and you'll make 30,000 a year. And I thought, I'm sold, I'm off to Athlone. Okay? That's, that's what I thought. In the meantime, though, with the internet and everything else, the first time someone types in the word plastic, 
they see, again, a seal trapped in, you know, in a can of... It has a very negative industry perception because people see the commodity um, waste problem of plastics. They don't see the high-end, high-value stuff. So it's very difficult to explain to some parent that little Johnny or little Mary is going to go to college and be involved in a very dynamic, high-performance you know, engineering field as opposed to you know, killing seals. So <laughs> that's basically it. Yeah, I think I, I was involved in trying to get people into engineering. It's a huge challenge. I mean, we, we don't have enough engineers across the board in Ireland. That's the starting point. And then you get into each individual division and it gets even more complicated. But the good news is there's plenty of opportunities for the students who are in the audience here who are engineers or are on the way to be engineers. There's some fantastic opportunities out there. It's a great time to graduate. So, and on the way to graduation, I know you mentioned uh, some research award there recently as well. We have a couple of PhD students in the audience as well. So we have some, but I suppose the, we'd like more is what you're saying to me. And you particularly mentioned Johnny and Mary. The problem is we don't have too many Marys. We have 85% of our students or 90% of our students are male, not enough female. That's a huge issue for engineering across the board and indeed I suspect in the, in the polymer side as well, you know. But great opportunity, so we need to get the, actively get the word out there. Anybody else got a quick question? One here, Robert. Um, Robert Duggan from Teva, Rob Duggan from Teva. For Mark, for the biomedical, um, we have a lot of companies, but they, a, lot of, a lot of people work in silos, you know, work with, keep um, trade secrets. A lot of stuff you can show here, especially in medical devices, where a lot of it is, uh, you know, the fraud competition between the stent manufacturers, etc. cetera. Um, for the biomedical group, it would be useful to have a forum or a way to um, have uh, like-minded or similar uh, people working in similar fields discuss and compare things that are not competitive processes efficiencies and some things like that so it would be a useful forum because it'll help lift the game if we could uh, maybe share some of the way that the work is done without sharing the um, trade secrets and, and there's a not really kind of I agree completely. That's a very good point. I just want to bring it back to the thing last time we're talking about. Thank you for that. Uh, that's a really good idea because the um, again, like I said, I assume I'm not speaking. It's such a multidisciplinary and collaborative type of industry, anyway. But if we talk about silos again, it's very much. I think everyone is acting to work working on certain things. And now we're focused on what you're working on. It would be very good to have kind of um, a neutral kind of open space where we can discuss people outside your immediate uh, side of you know, um, functional organization or outside the company and discuss it. Thank you for having us. Okay. Maybe at this stage, we uh, we might bring it to a close. Uh, hopefully, there's some teas and coffees outside. So maybe before we finish up, I'd just like to thank uh, our two speakers, particularly Sean, our keynote speaker, Sean Lyons, again for coming down from Atlone and making all the time to come down to us, and indeed Mark. And it's great that we have that col collaboration between the Southeast Engineers Ireland Southeast. And, and yourselves, and we'd like to keep that up. Maybe this is not a one-off event. We'll hopefully do, do more of this in the future. There's obviously a lot of interest locally in, in the biomedical sphere, which is great. And, and uh, so at this stage, maybe I'd just like to draw the event to a close to thank everybody involved, particularly Mary, who's done an awful lot of work to make this happen today. And I see Ivor here as well, the chair of the Southeast Committee. So Ivor, thanks for coming down. And we'll all have an opportunity to have a quick chat, maybe outside, and uh, something nice to eat um, over the next 10 or 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.